Welcome to Finding Holiness, where we delve into timeless Torah wisdom, revealing the sacred in everyday moments. Join us on a journey to elevate your spirituality and discover holiness in every aspect of life. I'm your host, Rabbi David Kadosh, and together, let's embark on a path of spiritual exploration. I hope you enjoy this next episode. Erev Tov, everybody. Hope you are doing well. It's nice to see everyone again. Welcome, whether you're listening live or you are listening in the future on our podcast at FindingHoliness.com. Welcome to our Monday night class between Pesach and Shavuot as we continue our series on Pirkei Avot. Tonight we are studying a Mishnah in the second chapter of the Mishnayot of Pirkei Avot. Let us take an opportunity to mention our series sponsors, our spirit sponsor, Mr. and Mrs. Eric ben Thank you so much in memory of Mr. Moshe Ben Ephraim, Zichronol Livracha. And tonight's class sponsors are Mr. Leon Siboni, in memory of his late wife, Simonique Hana Siboni, Zichronol Livracha, as well as Mr. and Mrs. Robert Stein, in memory of his late brother, Mr. Blaine Stein, Zichronol Livracha. With the words of Torah that we say tonight, Bileilu Nishmatam, and it should have, all the Nishamot should have an Aliyah. And of course, we, we always love to thank our sponsors, uh, if you wish to sponsor a class, you can contact me, findingholiness at gmail.com. You can go on our website, findingholiness.com, where you can click the link above to sponsor a future episode. And of course, check out and listen to all the previous Torah classes. Again, welcome everybody. We're happy you can join us tonight as we continue the second Perik in Perikeh Avot, the chapters of the fathers that are devoted to teaching us ethics, teaching us behavior, teaching us proper attitude how to conduct ourselves in preparation for Matan Torah, which is just over, just under four weeks away uh, in Yerush Hashem. Uh, just under five weeks away, mind you. Uh, we're looking at the first Mishnah in the second chapter. Last week, we looked at the first Mishnah in the first chapter. So we're going to look at the introductory Mishnah of the second chapter that was authored by none other than Rabbi Udah Hanasi, who's known as Rabbi. We'll talk about that soon, why he was given that name. But let's look at the text. Again, you can open any Sidur uh, if you want. You can look online for the text of, of, the, of the Mishnah, but I will read it for you and translate it for all our listeners. Rabbi Omer, Rabbi says, Ezohi derech yeshara sheyavor lo ha'adam. He asks a question. Which is the right path for man to choose for himself? Sheyavor lo ha'adam, that man should, should pass, pass by and go through. He answers, Kol shehi tif'eret le'oseha, v'tif'eret lo min ha'adam. Whichever path is harmonious, is tif'eret, is glorious, for the one who does it, v'tif'eret lo min ha'adam, and harmonious for mankind. And he continues, Ve'heve zahir b'mitzvah kala kebahamura. Be as careful with a minor mitzvah, as with a major mitzvah. The reason is, because you don't know the rewards of the mitzvot. Consider the cost of a mitzvah against its rewards. And any reward of an avera, of a transgression against the cost of the sin. Lastly, he says, contemplate the following three things. And you will not come into the hands of sin, transgression. Know what is above you. A seeing eye and a listening ear. And all of your deeds being ins- are inscribed in a book. So this is the Mishnah that was authored by, by Rabbi. Rabbi is Rabbi Yudah Hanasi. It was a title that was given to him by his colleagues. Uh, he, people explained that he was such a great leader. He was, uh, of course, Hanasi, Rabbi Yudah Hanasi. That's disrespectful to, to, to call him by name. So they just called him, not like Rabbi Me'i, Rabbi Yudah, it's just Rabbi. And the common term to address our teachers nowadays 
is actually Rebbe or Rebbe. This was taken from Rabbi Udan Nasi being the last of the Tanaim, the one who, of course, compiled the Mishnayot. That's what he was known for. He was known for compiling the statements of the Tanaim into a collective text, which we call Shisha Sidrei Mishnah, the six orders of the Mishnah. You should know that this was a very, very controversial thing that he did. Um, up until his time, everything was discussed and spoken about by heart. That's why it was called Torah She Be'alpe. Be'alpe is by heart. All the teachings of Moshe, any branches of the mitzvot that were taught by Moshe that we talked about last week to Yoshua to Zekenim, most of this stuff was done, was, was spoken by heart. And uh, he felt that the Torah was being, the Torah Shabbat was being forgotten. And he made it his mission to collect the statements of various Tanaim, not just of the generation that he lived in, but as well as the generation, previous generations. He was actually the fifth and final generation of the Tanaim. And he collected all these into, into writings and published it as the Shisha Sidrei Mishnah, the six orders of Mishnah, which is what we have today, which is... Uh, of course, the um, the nucleus of the Talmud, the Talmud, which consists of the Mishnah and the Gemara. And uh, again, this was very, very controversial because how can you write something that was meant to be by heart, that was meant to be taught by heart? That was the goal. The mission was that HaKadosh Baruch Hu only wrote down the Torah Shabikhtav, which is the Tanakh, the five books of Moses, and as well the, the the prophets up until the end of the Megillot. After that, we had no permission to write things down. So how could Rabbi Udanasi do this? So it was brought down in the Rambam that he felt that since people were forgetting all this information and all the various hundreds, thousands of laws that Moshe Rabbeinu was teaching by heart, that uh, that almost like the game of broken telephone, where as, it, as generations were passing, things were being forgotten, things were being misconstrued, things were being taught improperly, and he had to do something. And therefore he decided to collect the statements of the Tanaim into the Shisha Sidur Mishnah. So we can argue maybe this is why he chose to discuss this idea, this proper path. This was his proper path. That was the proper path that was needed in his eyes. That was the derech yeshara sheyavor lo ha'adam shetiferet lo min ha'adam vegam le'osea. This was something that he felt needed to do. It was advantageous to him, and it was harmonious for mankind. It was something that everybody benefited. We continue to benefit today, as there are hundreds of thousands of people that learn Mishnah on a daily basis. And even though to other people at that time and at that generation, that moment, it may have been a slap in the face. It may have been a um, uh, an act that was considered insulting to the previous generations, but he felt it needed to be done. And as Nasi, as the leader, as the president of the Jewish community at large in the entire world, this was a must. And it was a derech yashar that, that needed to be done to him because he knew what the future was going to hold. And we look back and we say, Baruch Hashem to Rabbi Udan Nasi, who did this to allow us all the Gemaras that you own, all the art scroll shafts that you own, the Mishnayot that you wrote in English, it's all thanks to him because he made the effort in collecting all of these statements of, of various other Tanaim, such as Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Akiva and Hillel and Shammai, so on and so forth. So he talks about this Derech Yeshara Sheyavor Lo Ha'adam. Derech Yeshara. Derech Yeshara means the straight path. What is the straight path? So the straight path has to be the truest path. It's the one that, that you know is going to get you to your ultimate destination. Everything else that is not straight, you know, you could get lost. And of course, you know, when, when, we, when we talk about things that sway back and forth, things that are gray and not black and white, you know it's probably not 100% true. So Rabbi noticed a problem that needed to be fixed immediately. Again, for generations, for generations, the other rabbis... A previous generations knew this, they saw this, they saw the problem that people were forgetting the Torah, but they were avoiding the issue. They were avoiding the fact that maybe we do have to start writing this down. And came Rabbi Udan Nasi and attacked it head on. If you go back uh, to the story of Yamsuf, when the Jewish people were stuck at the sea, not knowing where to go, you have a sea in front of them, you have the Egyptians chasing right on their, uh, on their neck, 
uh, are ready to, to run them down and destroy them. And they, they, they look up and, and uh, unsure what the next step is, came along a man named Nachshon ben Amiladab. And Nachshon took the leap of faith when entering Yamsuf. He says, well, Moses is saying to go, then I'm going to go. And he went in and the water was rising and rising right up until his, his, his chin and then his mouth. You know, a few more moments, he, he was dead. A few more moments, he would have drowned. But he felt this is the leap of faith that I need to take. If I don't go in and fix this, then how is Hashem's word going to come to fruition? So same thing with regards to Rabbi Udanasi. He felt that this is what this was the proper path to take. This was a straight path. This was going to ultimately lead to Emet. If I don't jump in and fix this, then what's going to be with the future? And that's a lesson for us when we think when we see things that are are just not working. What are we going to do about it? When we look around and we see problems in the community, problems with our family, problems with um, you know uh, uh, friends, are we just going to sit back and ignore it and let the like, next generation deal with it? Or are we going to be the Nachshon Ben Amid Adab? Are we going to be the Rabbi Yudan that's going to confront it head on and say, no, I'm going to fix this. You look at the word Sheyavor Lo Ha'adam. The word Sheyavor is very strange. Uh, I believe it should have said Sheyavor Lo Ha'adam. What is the the path that a man should pass through? Uh, the word is seems to be missing the letter Ayn. It should be Sheyavor. So what is the Lashon of Sheyavor? If you look at the numerical value of the word Sheyavor without the Ayn equals 512. 512. 512 is the same gematria of Adonai Emet. In other words, the proper path is always the one that Hashem wants you to take. That's the proper path that a person has to go. The one that pleases him the most. And you know that that's the Derech Emet, the Derech Hayashar. And maybe that's why the Tana chose to use this word, Sheyavor, which is really just a condensed word of the word Sheyavor Lo Ha'adam. This could be the implication of Kol Shehitif Eret Le'oseha. Um, uh, uh, anything that is harmonious or or pleasurable to the person who built it. Hashem laid out personalized paths for every human being. Every Jew, every non-Jew, every individual on earth has a specific job. And 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 our job is to use our free will, our Bechirach of Sheet, to find the path that pleases Him the most. And that's what makes a path the truest path the truest path. Then he goes on and he says that we need to be careful to be zahir, that we have to uh, be careful with a minor mitzvah as much as we do with a major mitzvah, with a strict mitzvah. Now, you have to ask yourself the following question. Do we even know what this means? What is the definition of this? We think we know what it means. We think we know what a light mitzvah is and a heavy mitzvah and a strict mitzvah is. For example, we associate murder, we associate slander, we associate matzah on Pesach, and Shabbat as very, very strict commandments. And we might associate uh, tithing, uh, praying with a minyan, or saying the Shema at night as lighter ones. But the truth is that's probably incorrect. We only make that assumption because we know what the punishment is for each one. The punishment for uh, willfully bl- breaking the Shabbat is death by stoning. The punishment of eating chametz on Pesach is karet. Uh, the uh, you know the punishment of embarrassing your friend, of course, is, is tantamount to murder, and murder, of course, is is death. So that's the only reason why we make these specific assumptions that these are the more severe mitzvot because of the punishment that is associated with this. It's strict in its punishment. But the, but the message is that it should not be treated any differently than the, than the bedtime Shema and vice versa. And the reason is, We don't know the reward that is generated from each performance of, of a mitzvah. How am I supposed to know whether what is in store, what is the, the cash value of mitzvah A versus mitzvah B. If God wants me to perform mitzvah A right now, then that's the one that's going to contain the most reward. Even though in my eyes, mitzvah A 
is diminished in the, in the eyes of mitzvah B. What's mitzvah A to me? It's small, it's nothing, it's insignificant. But at that moment, Hashem wants you to help that person cross the street. He wants you to stand up for the old man that walked into the room. He wants you to give a few coins to tzedakah. And because we're not, we don't, we're not aware of the calculations of Hashem as to, as to the reward of it, then we cannot, we cannot just only choose a strict mitzvot and ignore the other ones. The, there's a famous Mishnah, Masechet Pe'ah, that we quote every single day in Shachrit, at Korbanot, that there are certain mitzvot that are ochel perotehen ba'olam hazeh, ve'akeren kayemet lo le'olam ba. There are certain mitzvot that are so great that we get like a, we, we, we get a, a, a double advantage. We get to enjoy the fruits of him in this world, and then we also got to get the reward in the next world. Normally, when we enjoy reward in this world, that takes away from our bank account in the next world because we're using our points that we accumulated through our good deeds and acts of kindness and mitzvot, that is now taken away because I'm, I'm getting benefit. I'm, uh, you know, I got a nice car. I got a nice watch. I'm wearing a nice suit. Whatever it is, these are things are pulling, uh, uh, tugging away from our olam haba. But there are certain mitzvot that you can take and you, you'll get reward in this world, but it won't affect your reward in the next world. So those are, are fantastic mitzvot that we, sh- that we should constantly strive and aim for. But the idea is that, again, we should not distinguish between one and the other, thinking one is more important. We got to we have to uh, be zahir mitzvah kala keba hamura. If I have a mitzvah to say Shema at night, if I have a mitzvah to, to, to recite the Sefirat Omer as we're doing in the days now, we have, we have to treat it like, like eating matzah on Pesach, like not eating chametz on Pesach. That's how severe I got to treat it because I don't know, maybe Hashem wants me specifically to perform that mitzvah. But I also want to propose the following explanation. Maybe be cautious of the strict mitzvot like you do the easy mitzvot. Just like you have no problem standing up for a Tamil Chacham. I have no problem standing up when a rabbi walks in the room. I have no problem saying Shema Yisrael when I'm in shul. Sfiyat Omer, it's pretty easy. I say the bracha, I say the count. Maybe I should put the same effort more into the difficult ones because those are the ones that Hashem tests you with. It's a difficult mitzvot where God wants to see how much effort you're going to put through and the, and the work to be done. Matzah on Pesach is one mitzvah that we just finished completing and fulfilling. Matzah on Pesach, on one hand, is a very easy mitzvah. All I need to do is eat. At the same time, there's a lot, there's a minimum amount that I need to eat. The, the minimum minimum is the kazait. The maximum maximum is two kazaites at the first time you eat masa, another one kazaite when you eat the maror, and another two kazaites when you eat the afikoman. So it's really five kazaites on the night of the seder. Now, five kazaites is a lot of matzah, but a person that wants to fill the mitzvah 100, 100%, he's got to eat five kazaites. He still fulfills the mitzvah if he eats one kazait, but five is what Akados Baruch Hu is looking for to the people that really, really want to fulfill his will. Now, what's our response to that? Ah, I can't, that's too much, it's too this. But it, it, the, same, the same enthusiasm you have to recite Sfirat Omer, doing something easy, you should have when you're tested for something that is a little bit more, more difficult. You know, another difficult mitzvah that a lot of people have, diffi- uh, you know, again, some trouble, is answering Amen and Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo during the Hazara of the Amidah, something I've been focusing a lot myself and as well, trying to spread to, to my respective community. You know, such an easy mitzvah, yet it's so difficult. All you got to say is Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo, and Amen. There's 19 blessings in the Chazara of the Amidah. Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo, and Amen. Every Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo, every Amen that a person recites, it's another point, it's another check mark in Shamaim. But yet, we have difficulty because someone comes to talk to us. I space out. Uh, that's the time that I want to go to the bathroom. That's the time when I need fresh air and I have conversations. So something so easy becomes so hard. You don't know how deep, profound these things are. You don't know what the rewards are entail. Staying quiet for three minutes when it is difficult to outweighs so much more than everything else. In other words, don't be the Jew that only does things when it's convenient, but the moment it becomes too hard, that's when you just fall flat. That's when you show total disinterest. That's when you say, you know what, maybe this is not for me. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you easy mitzvot, but sometimes he tests you 
in its difficulty of lasting through. Can you be quiet for those three minutes while the Chazan is repeating the Amidah, even though someone is going to ask you a question? All it takes is for you to tell the person, not right now, just go like this, respectfully, nicely, answer the Amen, the Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. So maybe this is the meaning of Ve'eve Zahir Be'mitzvah Kala Ke'ba'hamura. Ve'eve Mechashev Hefsed Mitzvah Ke'neget Sechara. Then you should also consider the cost of a mitzvah against its reward, assuming you don't do it. Uschar avera keneged efseda, and the rewards of a transgression against its cost, assuming you do make the sin. A person who gets go back to the example of the person talking during the repetition of the amidah. A person who talks during the repetition, he would disregard the silent amidah. Uh, how can you say that? I, I respect the silent Amida. You respect the silent Amida. What if I was to tell you that according to the Ari Kadosh, the Arizal, that the Chazara of the Amida is more important than the silent Amida? You probably say, nah, it can't be. That's what he says. So if you really feel that the silent Amida, your silent prayer to Hashem is important, then shouldn't you pay close attention when it's being repeated out loud? Again, it's just one example of many. I said to my kahal recently that it was said of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Zecher Tzadik Libracha, that when he was in Minyan and the Chazan was repeating the Shmona Esrei, he would have his Tidur in front of him and following with his finger, word by word, as if he was saying, as if he was saying the Aminah, the silent Aminah, because he knew how important it is. But this also means, or this also teaches us, a statement about our attitude and our perception about mitzvot and averot in general. Ask yourself the following question before you perform an avera or before you are thinking about not doing a mitzvah. Simply, is it worth it? Is it worth not doing this mitzvah? Is it worth to perform this avera? At what opportunity cost does it mean if I choose not to? For example, it's bad weather. It's raining outside. It's a little chilly. It's May. I expected it to be warm. It's not warm. In fact, it's blowing uh, pellets and rain. Why do I need to go to Bet Knesset? I don't want to go to Bet Knesset. Analyze. What is the opportunity cost if you choose not to go to Bet Knesset? What will be missed if you choose not to go on this proper path, this Derech Yeshara? What is, it, what is the Derech Yeshara that's going to be missed? Well, think about all the amends and the Baruch Hu Baruch Shemos that we spoke about that you're going to miss. The fact that you're going to miss Tefillah Bet Sibur, you're, you're going to be praying by yourself. The fact that, uh, you know, Keriyat Shema with probably more Kavana. The fact that you're going to be singing the, the PU team and going through the Psuket de Zimra with a lot more concentration. All these things are going to be missed if you choose to stay at home simply because there's drizzle outside and it's not the, the weather that you expected. Another way of interpreting this concept of a loss of a mitzvah or the, the cost associated with not doing one um, is the mitzvah of rebuke. Actually, in this week's parasha, parashat kedoshim, we are commanded, that every Jew is commanded to rebuke his friend, so that he should not bear his iniquity, should not bear sin. The simple meaning is, I see my friend doing something wrong, I rebuke my friend. I tell him that what he's doing is wrong so that he shall not bear his sin. I have a moral obligation to correct my family, to correct my friends. You're not putting on your tefillin right. You're talking during tefillah. Why didn't you say a blessing before you ate? Why didn't you say birkat mazon if you ate this bread? You don't have a lulav. You know, why didn't you buy a lulav? You, 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 you say things and you rebuke your friends in a way in order to inspire him, in order to do a mitzvah, just like I will, or, or not do an avera, and just like I will give valuable advice if they are stumbling in their health or their financial decision, and I will tell them, don't buy that home if that home is worth uh, only half a million dollars and you're going to pay a million too. Why would you pay a million too if it's only worth half a million dollars? Or if I would, if I would rebuke my friend if I see him not exercising or smoking, or getting involved in alcohol and drugs, the same way that I would rebuke my friend for these situations, I would do the same thing for their spiritual decisions. Anything less is simply wrong. Then doesn't make me his friend. He doesn't count. He, he wouldn't count on me if I wouldn't do that. I expect my best friends and my family to do the same thing to me. And therefore, 
take action, give rebuke when you see him doing something wrong. The same way you would tell him, don't smoke because it's going to be bad for your health. Don't do this because it's going to lead to health problems in the future. Don't buy that stock because, you know, it, it, it's projected to go down. The same way you give him that advice, you also got to be mochiach, his spiritual dissension and, and, not, and, and try to get him back upwards. However, many chachamim explain the term velotisa alav chet on the rebuker himself. Rebuke your friend, but make sure that when you're rebuking him, you don't sin while doing so. Because oftentimes we don't know how to rebuke. In fact, the Chafetz Chaim was famous for saying that this is the most difficult mitzvah to perform because it's almost impossible to rebuke your friend that he's doing something wrong without insulting him, without him getting upset at you, without uh, shouting a comeback. And often this leads to friction, it leads to arguments, it leads to fights, God forbid. And therefore, this is something that a person needs to be weary about. This is maybe the implied meaning of the of the word, the, the term in the Mishnah. Ve've mechasev hefsed mitzvah keneged Sechara, be cognizant of the hefsed mitzvah, what you're going to lose out mitzvah, can they get the reward? Meaning, yes, if I fail to do a mitzvah, then I lose on the reward. But what if my fulfillment of the mitzvah brings me the opposite of reward? What if by me fulfilling the mitzvah of rebuking my friend is going to lead to bad things? That's also something I need to calculate. Maybe it's better for me not to do it if the end result gets me further away from the ultimate goal, especially especially if I don't know how to do it properly. The last part of the Mishnah that Rabbi Uda Hanasi states is the following. Know or consider, contemplate these three things. And you will not come to sin. Know what is above you. A listening, a seeing eye, a listening ear. And all of your deeds are inscribed in a book. So the three knows, the three things you need to know to avoid sin. First of all, it's a little bit unclear what these three things are in this Mishnah. What are the three things that Rabbi Uda Hanasi wants us to contemplate? Is the list of Sorry, it looks like I got cut off over there. Um, the the second thing is um, your uh, an eye hears and an ear uh, an eye sees and an ear hears. And the third would be all your actions are written down because knowing God's presence, knowing Hashem's fe- presence, feeling His presence is a predicate to any chance of spiritual t- success. Therefore. The prevention of Avera, the prevention of sin, is predicated on three types of awareness. Number one, you have a spatial awareness, meaning I'm I'm cognizant of what is around me. Da malemala mimach, that's number one. Then you have a relational awareness, which is based on what I perceive. This is on the sight of what I see or or, or, or sound of what he, what is heard. And lastly, there's a physical awareness that translates into a final product. So my actions can determine whether or not I am aware that Hashem is in front of me. And that is key to being preve- to preventing myself from doing sin, from preventing transgression. So let's discuss. Number one, Dama Mala Mimach. Know what's on top of you. On a simple level, 
This means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is on top of you. Shiviti Hashem Lenegi Tamid. I place Hashem in front of me always. The Rama Rabbi Moshe Iselis in his edit of the Shulchan Aruch. This is how he opens up the Shulchan Aruch. Shiviti Hashem Lenegi Tamid, quoting the Pasuk from David Amelech and Tehilim. Who called Gadol Batorai? says, This is a monster rule. The major rule in the Torah, and this is the greatness, the levels of the tzaddikim who walk in the path of Hashem. Nevertheless, nevertheless, when you pay close attention to the context, the verbiage of the wording, it says, the, know what is on top of you. It does not say, know who is on top of you. Who would have made more sense to mean HaKadosh Baruch Hu? It says, Male mala mimach. Not mi le malamimach. So I think the interpretation is you have to know that the ma, the what, is on top of you. What is the ma? Ma is the concept of humbleness. Ma is the concept of venachnu ma. It's an expression of nothingness. It's an expression of lack of worth, worthiness. This is the line that Moshe and Aaron said to Hashem. Humility always must be front and center if you wish to avoid sin. Ma, mem he, is the same numerical value as Adam, man, who the Mishnah started with. Ezohi derech yeshara sheyavolo ha-adam. Adam needs to be ma. They both need to be 45. Man needs to be humble. Man needs to be lowly. And this way, when a person is lowly, when a person is humble, that's how he prevents himself from sin. Because why should I go and reach out? Why should I go and do these things that are that are that is not what Hashem wants? I I, I understand that I'm so far away from Hashem. And if I want to get closer to Him, so therefore I'm not going to perform these acts. Another explanation is that what's on top of you, malemala, what is on top of you, mimach, comes from you. Meaning only you have the ability to come close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What is up there that you're striving to reach has to be mimach, has to be come, come from you. HaKol bidei shamayim chutz miyirat shamayim. Everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. Your parnasa meaning how much money you're going to make, your life, how long you're going to live, your health is all in Hashem's hand. But when it comes to your prevention of sin, when it comes to your fight against the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, you could ask Hashem to help you, but it has to come from you. If you want to be sur mera, if you want to refrain from evil and from the bad parts of this world, then you better be an asetov. You have to make sure that you're doing the good things. You have to take the action. You have to be the asetov. You have to do what is proper. The eye sees and the ear hears. So again, on a very basic level, Hashem sees what you do and hears what you say. This is no secret. Uh, human nature is uh, is to hide from everyone else other than the person that matters. You know, we have this idea of marit ayin in halacha. What are other people going to think when they see me do something? So if other people watch me doing something, even though what I'm doing could be right right, and proper, but if other people are going to think differently, then that's a problem. Because I do care what other people see and what other people hear of me. In fact, even... If you are in a secluded room, where nobody can see you, it's totally dark, no windows, you wouldn't be allowed to do that um, that action that has a marit ayin problem. And and, uh, and, and we call that lo plug. This is what the Chachamim wanted, regardless of where you are. But maybe, maybe the ayin in the marit ayin is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Even Bechadre Hadarim, he's watching you. Even when you are secluded in a room with nobody around you, God is watching to watch, see what, what, what you're doing. You can't escape. You can't escape. You, 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 see, you speak La Shonara, God hears you. If a person is constantly aware of this, then he won't sin. When a person is 
when a person believes that Hashem is watching me, he's watching me in my room, he's watching me in the bathroom, he's watching me on the beach, he's watching me on the golf course, in the classroom, in university, he hears my conversations, he hears the conversations with my wife, with my children, with my boss, with my sister. If you knew that, for sure you would watch your mouth, for sure you would watch every action you do. If you knew that there was a microphone connected to you at all times, 24-7, it was, it's a spiritual microphone, and the sound waves are being blasted to Shamaim and sending waves, waves of voices to heaven constantly. Would you not watch what you say? The Ayn Ro'ab Ozen Shamat. It's there. He's listening. So why don't we pay more attention to it? All this, I believe, is the basic way of interpreting this Ayn Ra'abe Ozen Shamat. But I would like to suggest the following, that the eye and the ear that are that is seeing and hearing is not just a HaKadosh Baruch Hu that is watching you and listening to you, but these are your eyes and your ears. Because what you see in life and what you hear in life literally has a direct effect on your spirituality and your ruchniyut. And guess what? It's instantaneous, immediately. What you see and what you hear can never be taken back. It's like a child who sees a scary movie or sees a part of a movie that that freaks him out. He'll remember it forever. I remember when I was this and I saw the scary movie. Oh my gosh, the images remain in his mind. It's a fear that doesn't go away. He is traumatized. A person that lost a relative will never forget the day that they were told of the news of the passing. Those things are ingrained in the mind. He heard something and it made an impact at that moment that is going to stay with him. I remember the day I found out that so-and-so passed away. So when you see things that you shouldn't, when you hear things that you're not allowed to hear, your neshama remembers. And as much as you want to forget, you don't forget. And this is something that is very, very practical and applicable today, where we are constantly faced by visual distractions and audio distractions. We've spoken in the past about uh, uh, immorality, uh, uh, abominations. We spoke about billboards. We spoke about movies. We spoke about things that the eye should not hear, should not see, and it's so apparent. It's so blatant. It's so you know visually, you know, smack in our face that you can't do anything about it. Those images are recorded in our brain in our hard drive that's correct, connected directly to our neshama. These are things that we shouldn't be seeing. We're not supposed to follow our, our hearts and our eyes that lead us to these things. We spoke about how the the mind wanders last time. And this is something that is, is, is leaving an imprint. The audio distractions in this world, and you're probably thinking, what audio distractions are there? I don't have any audio distractions. Besides for the fact we spoke about the you know, your, your, the, the vibrator on your phone and your notifications. That's not the audio distraction I'm talking about. What about the music? What about the things that, on the radio? You know, you listen to a song on the radio and, and half the words are bleeped out. They're bleeped out because they're full of, 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 of swear words, vulgarity. And the, the radio station is doing us a favor by bleeping out these words. And to know that our children are listening to this and they think nothing is wrong. To know that parents are playing this music in front of their kids, thinking that there's nothing wrong with it. You don't think that's an audio distraction? You don't think that's going to affect the, the way the person speaks? Of course it will. Of course it will. That person's, that child's speech, that adult speech will never be the same once you hear these words. Because now it becomes part of his vocabulary or her vocabulary. So these are things that we have to be aware of. It's your eye, it's your ear that's listening. And that's what's causing you to sin. So if you watch what your eye sees, if you watch what your ear hears, it will act as a preventive measure from you sinning. And last but not least, is that 
all your actions are written down. Bekol ma'asecha basefer nichtavim. So, on a simple level, in heaven there's a very, very big, thick book. And again, your actions are all jotted down. It can't escape. You can't escape. You can't claim it's not true. It's not my word against God's because God's wins. Everything is there. Everyone has a personal diary that is written by an angel writer. And it's the most precise and exact diary that anyone can ever have. It's like a, a teacher that's trying to um, correct students' behavior. And the student, because the student is acting out and says, listen, everything you do, I'm going to jot down. Everything you do, I'm going to write down. And at the end of the term, I'm going to show your parents. I'm going to show what you've done, what you've done that's good and what you've done that's not good. And all of a sudden, when the child knows that, he won't budge. Oh, guarantee he'll behave because he knows that everything's going to be shown to his parent. He will need constant reminders. When the child acts out, the teacher might snap his finger, do some sort of gesture to get his attention, and then point to the book. Okay, now I'm good. If we knew that everything we did is being written down, Hashem is keeping a, a log second by second, minute by minute of what we do. <laughs> Of course, we wouldn't come to sin. Another way we can explain this, All of your actions are recorded in the Sefer. The Sefer here could be the Torah. The Torah is the Sefer. A person should believe that everything that is to become history is found in the Torah. Of course, you may have read uh, books and articles written about Bible codes. Uh, Bible codes are legit. They're 100% true. We don't know the future, but we can look at the codes for what took place in the past. When a person understands this and and he can internalize the authenticity of the Torah, of the Torah and the mitzvot, he won't come to sin. Because I know that my life is set out for me. I know that after 120 years, we will look back and all my actions are there in the Torah. It's everything. The Torah came before the creation of the world. What I've done and what I will do is all hinted there. I may not be able to find it, but you should know, it's written there. So how do I want my legacy to remain? Of course, yes, we do have free will, but I want my legacy to be one of positive. If I'm a person who is kind-hearted and loving and and you know giving, charitable, who, who does mitzvot, then that's what's going to be found in the Sefer Torah when they're looking at my Bible codes. They're looking at it and they're saying, wow, look what this look at what this person managed to accomplish. But if God forbid I live a life of arrogance and I live a life of stinginess and I live a life of uh, evil, then yeah, they're going to find the same thing about me in the Torah as well. So what do they want? What do you want others to find about you in the Sefer where your actions are being written down? And thirdly and lastly, the way to conduct yourself is written in the Torah. Bekol ma'asecha, the way, how you act, your ma'asim, basefer nichtavim. If you want to know what to do and how to do it, look in the Torah. Look at our forefathers. Look at our prophets. Look at our kings. Learn everything from them. Where they succeeded, where they stumbled. Yes, it's amazing and great to learn about the successes of King David, David Amelech. But it's not just enough to be envious of the successes, but how he overcame his failures, how he learned from his mistakes, how he cried for so many years for what he did with Bacheva, even though the Talmud clearly states that he didn't do anything wrong, but he cried for years because of the impression he gave to others, what other people saw, what the Ayn Ro'ah from others it didn't look good. It was shady. It was not derech yeshara. It was not a straight path. I learned to choose peace. I learned to chase peace from Aharon HaKohen. I learned to be humble from Moshe Vaish Moshe Anav Me'od. Kindness from Abraham Avinu. Diligence in Torah study from Yaakov Avinu. Our ma'asim, our actions are codified in the Sefer that we call Tanakh. 
And when I study Tanakh, and I learn about my forefathers and my elders and the kings and the prophets, and I see the lives that they were not perfect, and that's fine. It's fine not to be perfect, and we should never think of them to be perfect. They made mistakes, but we all make mistakes. Our goal and our mission is to find the straight path. The one that's tiferet le'oseha, the one that's tiferet to Hashem who made that path, and tiferet lo mina adam, that all the rest of history before us, all our forefathers experienced on that path. That's what we have to strive for. That's what we have to aim for. Thank you for joining me tonight. Please join me next week as we look at the third chapter of Perkei Avot, next Monday night, Bezrat Hashem. Thank you, everybody. Don't forget, Rate, review our podcast if you love this episode. We're great. It really puts us up on the charts. It was great seeing everybody tonight. Remember, holiness matters. Have a wonderful night.